This video contains spoilers for the following games. If you have any interest in playing any of these games, I'd recommend skipping these portions of the video since they contain major spoilers. Within Team Hitbox's 2012 platformer Dust Force exists a level so absurdly difficult that out of the several tens of thousands of people that have played it, less than 1% of his players have seen its conclusion, and it goes by the name of Yota. A perfect amalgamation of all of the skills that the player has attained up until that point put to a brutal test that many have failed. Only 646 people have finished it, and while that alone doesn't make the level valuable, it's the brutality of the map that makes it such a riot of a level. Being a standout example of how to wield difficult difficulty as a tool in the game designer's arsenal, and what I would consider to be the greatest level of all time among any video game. But before we get to any of that pretentious shit, it's your boy, Leon Massive. Did you know there's enough of you here now that I can make a living off of this shit? It's not a bunk machine, it's a fence. If you've played video games for any stretch of time, I'm sure you're no doubt familiar with challenge, and not necessarily socially, although I'd be willing to bet you're about as socially capable as snakes and rats coming to diplomatic agreements. Whether that be the bizarre difficulty blocks of an easy game, a final boss so hard that you could nickname him Johnny Sins, or a lack of challenge to counterbalance the conflict of most games, difficulty is hard baked into the culture of the medium. For as much as I don't like making a habit of pointing out the obvious, not necessarily all games feature challenge and difficulty. Games like The Beginner's Guide and What Remains of Edith Finch, while not defined by any lack of challenge, are games that are absent of mechanical conflict that most games that we normally think of are rife with. But the difficulty of conflict is good, it's fun, it's complex, it's immediately understandable. It's why I've got a full billion hours in games all about punching the shit out of each other, even though I don't really care about MMA or boxing or like cars. But with conflict comes difficulty, and as games have developed and evolved, difficulty and conflict has metamorphosized to fit this microtransaction global warming death world. Yes, I am prone to existential dread, can you tell? To the point where saying things like this game is hard basically means nothing to me. I like this hard game. I fucking hate this hard game. And that's because difficulty is a tool, and the ways that games use difficulty will ultimately decide if I care, or if I use you as a running gag throughout the whole channel. While there are difficulty curves, and they're particularly important to the pacing of a game, what we're going to talk about here is more what difficulty can do, and its purpose outside of just pacing challenges. To me, there's three types of difficulty, and while I've got a pretty clear bias towards two of these, if we're going to talk about game design, it's not fair to discredit the ugly duckling of the group, as it's part of quite a lot of games. These three types of difficulty being the difficulty of execution, the difficulty of comprehension, and the difficulty of size. Execution and comprehension are unashamedly my favourite kids, and decently self-explanatory. Is the thing hard to do in terms of getting your hands to move in the right way at the right time to complete the task defines execution. While no fighting game ends up being about it in the long run, it's the part that you find hard when you're learning to throw one of these motions, or god forbid one of these fucking eldritch abominations. Comprehension is your ability to process the information being shown to you. Can you balance and understand the consequences of your actions and see forward, or even begin to understand what is even laid out in front of you. While this is hands down the one that I'm worst at, it's one that I've got a lot of fondness for. Puzzle games like Baba Is Your and Finifactory ask you to create an outcome and gives you a set of tools to create that outcome yourself. They demand you to think more actively and fry my brain out by like the 10th level with a newfound appreciation for just how stupid I am. I have like one GCSE, what do you expect? It's the understanding of the steps towards a desired goal that create the difficulty as opposed to your ability to perform the action to the outcome. And then there's size, which isn't defined by any type of strain that it puts on you, but purely how much of a gap there is between you and the goal there is. For the hip preteens on Instagram, this is what you would call the grind. Now I can guarantee that by pure statistic I've made one of you mad, with your justification being that just because something takes a long time or is grindy, it doesn't mean that it's hard, but I don't necessarily think that that's true. Ignoring how size can be applied differently, which we'll get into eventually, closing the gap on a large task is a strange type of difficulty that I normally wouldn't vibe with. The concept of chipping away at something to gain my reward also excites me about as much as a sandpaper fleshlight. But just because me and you and most of us here don't really like the idea doesn't mean that we can't find examples of where we do like it or where it's even good. We might not all agree that Cookie Clicker is a good game, but what makes it work is the distance in progression. There's a satisfaction to getting a new building type or reaching a new cookie count and making the number increment because it either took a lot of time or took a lot of effort to achieve. If we were given that reward without putting any work in, we wouldn't receive that satisfaction. It would be like if we pressed crouching medium kick and we got a full combo. We'd like some of that work and the barrier to the outcome. The size of the next goal, the time that we need to invest to work for it, and the anticipation that we build towards the next goal is a pretty key part of that. And there's a game that I think perfectly encapsulates the power of this difficulty that most of us actually quite like. 
Minecraft is a game that might literally need no introduction if you've been on the internet for more than four minutes, so I'm sure that most of you can already see where I'm going with this, but Minecraft uses the scope of its grind to create a unique feeling of success within the player. When it comes to resource collecting, scarcity and rarity are extremely vital to the power that Minecraft has in creating that moment of achievement. Diamonds are rare and powerful, and because of the workload that you need to put into them, they gain a certain level of wonder around them. Mining away at the grey void for a long time to find that light blue glistening through the rock shares a similar amount of satisfaction that I'm assuming Bitcoin might miners feel when their bot purchases a new graphics card, the scum fuck bastards, and makes the resource come with both an external reward in the diamond itself and an internal reward in relief and achievement. Running through a cave network to randomly stumble upon a set of diamonds then has this new feeling, like finding a winning lottery ticket in a sewer drain. The jackpot feeling comes from your contextual knowledge of how long it takes to gain that resource, not just the power that it holds. And because the grind is long, you're inclined to find shortcuts to them, or find better ways of reducing the workload. You form strip mines to maximize the amount of space that you cover compared to mining randomly. You learn that TNT mining, while in your head sounds like a genius idea, is entirely pointless. You install a texture pack that allows you to see through the world. Don't do this in a multiplayer server, by the way, you're just being an asshole. And in that work, and sometimes the circumvention of work, we find achievement. If the game did this, Hey, I got you this because we both love crack cocaine. It wouldn't be an engaging way to be rewarded, because the difficulty of work and grind is what really gives us that payoff. However, back on the surface of Minecraft, you've got an entirely new difficulty based on size, and I don't mean whatever you're searching on this website, I mean more size and scope in buildings and projects. While diamonds of resource scarcity is dictated by the game, creative aspirations are a combination of what the game permits and the goals that the player wants to set themselves. If I asked you to build a massive fuck off castle, most of you would say fuck that, even if I gave you infinite resources. That's not necessarily because you can't do it, it's because you don't like the challenge of chipping away at a goal that's in that massive scale. Much like how the difficulty of learning mechanically complex combos with consistency in fighting games can turn people away from playing it since it's not a type of difficulty that they find in engaging. For a core audience of consumers, putting a large amount of distance between you and a goal normally isn't seen as difficult or even a good design choice, but it's ultimately core to a large amount of games that work well. Quite a lot of games that appeal to an atypical gaming audience generally use this size difficulty. Animal Crossing, Stardew Valley, Pokemon, all of these games use size and the success of conquering the scale of what you're doing as part of its difficulty, even if it isn't what we would normally consider a challenge. And much like how these games use size and their difficulty as a tool in what makes their game great, others can choose to omit or lean on other bits of difficulty to make their game interesting and change its appeal over time. For example, if I was to ask you what difficulty rhythm games lean on, I'm sure some of you would say execution, some of you would say a mix of execution and comprehension, and the minority of you would say it's throwing all three into a blender like you're this guy from Unfriended. And the reality is, you're all correct to an extent. Everyone's a winner, we're all correct all the time, here's your gold star to say you know what the fuck you're talking about. At the start of a rhythm game, you're just going to be learning how to hit things at the right time if you've got the same ability ability to stay on tempo like my ability to stay in a good mood after seeing zero matches on Tinder Bumble and the last desperate pick of Christian Mingle. But pretty quickly it becomes a challenge of what's actually coming at me, combined with my ability to react to it accordingly. As you go up and up in difficulty, you start to see different maps push that difficulty in different directions. Because I've played Osu for a long time, I can comprehend the map of the Big Black perfectly fine, but by god I will never be able to fucking execute on it. I'm going back to playing Mr. Brightside in my goddamn Weeaboo game, fuck this. But if you want to get a perfect score on every song, you gonna run into the difficulty of size. God forbid you want to do it in a game with custom maps, have fun chipping away at the latest anime openings mapped by someone who can't even tell you what a fucking time signature is. I can't tell you what it is either, but at least I'm not the one who has to fucking understand it! And the large majority of multiplayer games will have this kind of expanding over time, especially if you're playing real-time games. While most first-person shooters will have execution ceilings growing rapidly forever, they'll still have infinitely expanding comprehension and size as people discover new things about the game and how it works. If you need an example, I present to you more of the color grey. <laughs> in Counter-Strike, a smoke works like almost every other smoke grenade in video games in that it blocks off a sightline and if you're inside of it, it's hard to see. The thing is, in Counter-Strike, they're really important because the time to kill is literally instant in some instances, and moving and shooting makes you about as accurate as an archer without arms. That analogy doesn't work how I thought it would work. The part that's important to this video is how it expands comprehension and size. Because at a low level, I can use smokes to block off key areas so long as I have a sightline to it. I don't like this sightline, so I'm gonna smoke it off and pass through for free. But as your understanding of the map expands, you might start to look for setups that allow you to smoke off hard to peek areas without a sightline. I don't like taking this corner fight, so I'm gonna smoke it off. If I wanna go for the low difficulty option, I can peek it, hope I don't die, and throw a smoke. But it's risky, and at that point, why not just take the gunfight 
anyway. Here's why, I'm almost always going to lose it. So instead, I'm going to try and find a way of smoking off this corner without peeking it. The process I take to finding this isn't necessarily important, whether that be looking up a guide that's screaming at me to like, comment, subscribe for 10 minutes before actually giving me what I fucking came here for, or going to the map and just throwing a billion nades and seeing where they land. What's important is that once I find that knowledge, I keep a hold of it, and in doing so I expand my understanding of the map and the potential choices that I can make which raises the difficulty for my opponents. In multiplayer spaces, the game's difficulty rises as your opponent's skill and understanding improves, which is literally true for every single multiplayer game in existence. Fighting games can get really intimidating a year into their lifespan because there's just so much that you need to comprehend and understand and the easy combos that would have taken you far in the first week just aren't even BMBs anymore. I just I don't want to fucking learn Melty. There's too much shit. And card games have a difficulty in size expansion at a level that my tiny brain can't even comprehend. Even without new cards coming out, the meta evolves with viable decks and potential cards that can be in any given hand that it goes from difficult to keep in your head to dig god get me out of here I just want to play a meme deck where every card is from a spider. This expanding scope of difficulty is especially true for any long term game that lives with constant updates and new content which makes me wonder how companies like Riot are going to consider circumventing holy shit there's too much to learn syndrome when champ 300 is released for League of Legends. I don't really have a point to make here I just thought that was like you know kind of interesting yeah I fucking know. This kind of expansion and difficulty isn't always what players want myself included sometimes I just want to feel group euthanasia and turn my brain off with the boys. So games like Pummel Party use a lot of randomization to make it so that even if someone is good at the game through execution and comprehension, that ambiguity of what is a good or a bad choice and how the player gets to victory limits the actual impact of excelling in those points of difficulty. But within multiplayer, I'd say that none of these games are designed to be difficult by nature, since the nature of multiplayer dictates that it can only be as hard as your opponent is willing to make it. That's a bit of a generalization, but let me segue out of this please and begging you. But there are games that are specifically designed around the nature of difficulty itself, like getting over it with Bennett Foddy, Steven Sausage Roll, and Quop. Uh, I'm deadly serious. The thing is, while getting over it uses a lot of difficulty in size, Quop uses difficulty in execution, and Susur uses comprehension, they all use difficulty for different purposes. Getting over it uses its difficulty to create a feeling of dread and fear. It's combined with the difficulty in execution, but it uses the Mammoth Mountain without checkpoints to produce consequences for actions that incite dread that I'm certain has brought someone to literal tears. It's not me though, I, I'd never cry at a video game. If the size of the task was much smaller, say by having every section divided into distinct levels, you wouldn't get that same kind of emotional resonance, which certainly wouldn't be a bad thing to a lot of players, after all this game is very well crafted, independent of its larger difficulty, but it wouldn't create the same kind of infamy that this game holds in its difficulty. Jump King, and almost any game where small errors have large repercussions, also do this. I'm just using Bennett Foddy's work as an example because I think he's really cool, and so that's why I'm using him twice. Steven Sausage Roll uses its difficulty and comprehension to create walls that stupefy the player and create absurd moments of feeling like a genius when you finally see a way through to the answer. Baba is you also does this and it's also amazing but everyone knows about Baba. I talked about it earlier, fuck it. The emotion you feel is something akin to triumph and while we might think about that more in the sense of achieving something big like through a more traditional boss fight which we'll talk about later, the emotion here comes from the difficulty of the clarity to your goal rather than the task directly. Quop uses its executional difficulty to inspire a kind of comedy. While games like I Wanna Be The Guy are hard to inspire frustration within the player, Quop is hard to create big funny haha which is why there's an abyss of let's players using its Filler. Admittedly, the comedy is a fusion of context and gameplay, but if the premise of a man runs 100 meters is the setup, the punchline is the execution. Having to use Q, W, O, and P to control the different parts of the legs to run across a track and causing a flailing mess in a competitive setting. Without the execution here, the joke simply doesn't work. Here, I'll show you. Can I be on live with the Apollo now? These games to me show that while difficulty in our heads might be very one track and simple, its purpose is actually quite diverse. It's not that this is hard is what triggers us to enjoy a challenge, but the purpose and application of difficulty inspires emotion beyond simple frustration. Now these are games that are entirely built around their difficulty, and because of that, serve a niche that a wider audience isn't always going to be receptive towards. But in games with a bit more of a wide appeal, you can still find points where difficulty is implemented to add flavour, and if we're going to talk about difficulty, you know no, I need to talk about the big one. For some people, this might seem like a bit of an odd transition out of games that are designed to be hard. After all, it's Dark Souls. The enhanced edition is literally called Prepare to Die. But if you read any of the interviews from the game's director, it's clear that unlike the previous games, the game isn't hard for the sake of being hard, but the difficulty is in fact a byproduct of the type of world that they wanted to create. Dark Souls uses its absurd difficulty to reinforce the feeling of the world being cruel and unforgiving. Its difficulty is a reflection of the environment. The bosses aren't hard for the sake of being hard, they're hard to instill the sense of hopelessness and crushing despair of the world around you. 
Not that one. These bosses are impenetrable walls that keep the world at a standstill. But by proxy, this creates an immense feeling of relief when you finally overcome one of them challenges, only to be short-lived by the knowledge that a new challenge is ahead of you, with that challenge seeming unscalably large. But at no point is the game hard for the sake of needless difficulty, or at least that's the intention. It's hard for the sake of being cruel. It's why when the game plops you down after getting out of the first area, it faces your camera in this direction, where it will falsely point your attention towards two areas that will crush you instead of the correct area which is directly behind your character. It wants you to feel despair through the world, the characters, and the difficulty. Its bosses, while often seen as the defining point of its difficulty, is only one part in that emotion, and if we're going to talk about bosses, you know we're going to have to talk about that boss fight. Sans. Now Undertale isn't a hard game, at all, it's a super simple baby's first shmup contextualized within a comfortable story about friendship and belonging, things that none of us are familiar with. But within the super secret I'm gonna kill literally everything root of the game, you'll find the familiar comfortable boss fights of before replaced with an absolute gauntlet run that feels like a literal nightmare, what is happening? But like, there was nothing stopping the base game's bosses being this hard on a normal run, if Toby Fox really wanted to drag you through the mud on your first go around, he could've. But he chose not to, in order to to not let the difficulty overpower the story being told to you and allow you to think more on the characters and the setting. But in the genocide run, the story is entirely different in that it's absent and lonely as you walk around towns devoid of life, you either being the one that took it or the one that caused them to flee in fear. And so the boss fights of before, while they can be a matter of life and death for these characters, isn't built up to be one for them. They don't bring their A game because they don't expect this to be the end. You're merely a human to hunt, but here you are the hunter. The extreme ramp up in difficulty is a reflection of the fear that you've created as the monsters of the underground fight with every ounce of their being under the knowledge that it might be their last. Once you've reenacted a massacre that would make even Genghis Khan think you've gone too far, you get to Sans. Under normal circumstances, he wouldn't even be a fight, in fact he'd more warn you of the danger going forward, but here his unassuming nature gets revealed to be hiding a powerful goliath of a creature, with more control than you could have imagined. Now that I've told you all of this, imagine that after all this build up, the fight was more continued contextually difficult rather than physically difficult. What I mean by contextually difficult is the challenge that's presented in something like Metal Gear Rising in a lot of its earlier bosses. The actions are strenuous for the player character but not the player, which is great for an action game when it's in its educational slash introductory phase, but as time goes on it doesn't always convey the struggle that we're looking for since we want some of that difficulty to be on ourselves. With Sans, the struggle is on you the player, and it's a struggle that tests every single one of the difficulty types, especially the Don't Get Undertale's best fight spoiled in the year 2021 challenge. Not only does the fight demand that you make split second decisions, but that you're also able to comprehend new and overwhelming situations faster than ever before, going so far as to ask you to juggle execution with menu navigation by making it so that your menu icon is a hitbox, never giving you a moment to breathe and compose yourself. Which makes sense because your standard hitbox is already the icon that you use in combat, and without that you might leave the player confused as to what exactly is happening. And also contextually, of course you're not going to let someone stand there and prep their next attack if it's going to be the fight that ends your existence, with the length of the fight lasting on average about 6 minutes. It's not only difficult for difficulty's sake, but it's also a reflection of the desperation in the characters that you've helped to create, and instills an uncomfortable sense of victory as you take down the characters that clearly weren't even trying before, like they'd all recently gotten off of Cozy Grove. Which is a game that's kind of like Animal Crossing, in that it's a cute little game about the company around you, with a bit more emphasis on completing tasks, and less emphasis on being made by these fucking assholes. Holes. With that in mind, you might be able to tell that this game gets about as hard as erectile dysfunction, but much like those with perpetual limp dick, it doesn't mean there can't be any pleasure, with some people liking it even more that way. The lack of being a hard game, not, you know, soft cock. The difficulty in something like Cozy Grove is the amount of tasks that you need to complete in your goals creatively, and so leans extremely heavily on its massively unscalable size, but makes every other portion of gameplay extremely lax in order to never make it draining. Which rides alongside its contemporaries, but I still think that there's a stark difference in the level of vibey that Cozy Grove gives off compared to something like Stardew Valley, and I think that a large amount of that comes from how the game paces out the scale of its tasks. Stardew Valley attempts to pace out its content with a slow and steady stream and does so with a time system that's bound to the game world, with each in-game day taking roughly about 15 minutes. With each day there's small tasks that might only need doing once, or there's tasks that can be done infinitely so long as you've got the stamina for it. The thing is that once a day is over you're able to immediately go to the next, and because nothing can be completed in one day, you might find that you get entirely absorbed into going on to the next day 
need to go into the next task, which you need to finish, which you needed to wait a whole day for. I'm not so blind that I'm going to say something like, this is stressful and life on the farm is hard for the player. But what I will say is that this isn't always the experience that the user might be looking for in a calm game, because they might feel inclined to keep playing for extended periods of time, which makes them sink hours in when they might just be looking for like a 30 minute experience. Although Cozy Grove does go by the same game flow, you know, finite tasks that can be completed every day with some spanning over multiple days and infinite tasks that can go alongside it, the Haunted Island doesn't let you stay on the grind like you're a 20 follower Instagram influencer. Instead, the cycle of content is restricted to the real world day cycle, which will either have you leaving the game session quietly satisfied like a light snack before the day starts, or leave you bored to tears starving for more like you've just finished an 11 hour shift and you were rewarded with two McDonald's fries sold to you as a meal. The limit that the game puts on your ability to access new content is supposed to make it so that you never feel pressured into continuing playing for long periods of time, and allow you to put the controller down with a feeling of a accomplishment and progression. Whether or not that's an emotion that resonates with you through this restriction will vary from person to person. If you end up time traveling and Animal Crossing like you're reenacting your favorite Spongebob episode, like me, I don't think this type of restriction will suit you. I'm very task oriented in what I like about games, and so scaling back any and all difficulty and not letting me plow through a task in order to control the pace strikes me about as comfortably as a baseball bat to my bare balls. With all that said though, Cozy Grove stands as yet another example of how you can use difficulty, not using the difficulty to highlight narrative or create tension but instead removing as much of it as possible in the hopes of putting the player's mind in a state of calm. And there's a bajillion more uses for difficulty, but really I'd feel like I was just going around in circles if I was to dissect anymore, so let's just do a fucking lightning round. Katamari fakes a difficult final level by asking you to access a larger task than ever before, even though in reality it gives you so much time that it makes it feel more like an urgent victory lap. Mario Kart pulls back on the difficulty of its early levels in order to make it so that you can focus more on the context of what's happening, and have big old happy fun time before the tracks actually get a little bit difficult to navigate in order to shift what you find annoying over time instead of hitting you all once. Jenny could have chosen more intense platforming, but chose to omit it with simple roadblocks in order to ensure a more consistent pacing. Most of the Binding of Isaac bosses just throw a shitload of things on the screen and hope that you can comprehend it instead of making it executionally complex. Every game in the arcade had dogshit difficulty spikes to take your money away, a business practice that some companies still somehow get away with even today. Shadow of the Colossus probably has one. I haven't finished it. I'll let you know on the screen if I find something. Anyway, go ahead and pause that if you want to read it. The point of all this, and basically the, the whole video, is to show you that difficulty isn't a blanket, hard or easy, but instead a flexible tool with a wide range of purpose. And because of that, I don't think that it should be assumed that a good difficulty curve should be a literal curve, but more like a mountainside with peaks and valleys to reflect developer intention. Which is a part of why I think that Dust Force handles its final level with such finesse. I would strongly consider Dust Force to be the greatest platformer ever made, yes, even more so than Celeste or whatever classic SNES platformer you're thinking of. What I love about Dust Force is the absurd level of control that I feel through my character combined with how I feel bound by the world. Sliding around with momentum and your ability to conserve and control it without slamming yourself into some spikes feels amazing. The game also never revels in your failure or inability, the failure just merely exists. Because of the incredible incredibly slick control that you have over your character combined with a laid back approach to failure, it makes for a game that feels oddly calm. That sense of calm being reflected back at you through gorgeous visuals and one of the best video game soundtracks to be released in the 2010s alongside all of these ones. The levels are also incredibly diverse, with some being super simple episodes of enjoyable movement, some being precise threading the needle affairs, and others being levels with real weight behind every single jump and slash. I say all of this to prove a point, in that what I love about Dust Force is not that it's hard. I think that many of the strengths of Dust Force exist without the presence of impactful challenge, to the point where some of my favourite levels in Dust Force are some of the easiest. Dust Force never really alludes to an ending, it's more a collection of levels that you can enjoy at your own leisure, allowing you to create your own difficulty curve, but it does have a set of levels that are clearly designed to be a conclusion. After you perfect every level in every section of the overworld, you gain access to a new area of the hub. Tucked away at the top of the map exists a set of levels marked only by an exclamation mark, and here lies far and away the game's hardest challenges. An extreme spike in difficulty, where some of the problems that were alluded to in some of the levels are now the standard. And once you finish all of them levels, you are greeted with Yota. This is a mammoth of a level, with a world record time dwarfing every other map in the game. While most other levels in Dust Force are hard but clearly possible, Yota is difficult and almost a 
abyss-like in its quality in that it just keeps throwing challenges at you, with execution requirements that none of the game has asked of you previously, but skills it will have taught you. Because of this, it can take hours to finish Yota for the first time, with my first time taking a combined total of five hours over four days. But the difficulty that this map imposes really sells that feeling of a grandiose climax that a game that's so unassuming yet masterfully woven as Dust Force deserves. And when you finally conquer the mountain in front of you and stand atop it a champion, it feels glorious. Oh, there we go! Let's fucking go! Ah! <laughs> Oh my god, six years. I've had this game for like six, seven years. Oh, holy shit. Oh my god. <laughs> Let's fucking go. Oh.